everybody. Happy Wednesday. It is good to virtually see you here tonight, and hopefully you guys have had a good week. And uh, it has been busy around here. I'm sure it has been for you guys as well. Um, but we are getting closer to Easter, and obviously Easter for us in the church world is a, uh, is a pretty big uh, pretty big event and time. Obviously, we get to celebrate the resurrection, which is awesome, but also busy, busy, busy. So we're getting everything lined up for that. Um, we want to definitely continue praying for one another and uh, that God would open up doors for us to be able to share Christ's message uh, during the season. We already got a couple emails today of people that have lined up family and friends to be able to attend with them on Easter and are praying for their salvation. We're going to continue to do that. And there's a few different ways that you can do that. Okay. The first one, um, you'll see all over the church Facebook page, which you're probably on right now, a lot of different stuff from Easter, whatever pops up. Okay. I want to encourage you to click that share button on it and share it with your friends and your family. You'll see a bunch of photos of people from church. They'll come up with a little sign that says, join me for Easter. You'll see the video that we posted yesterday, uh, things like that. That'll show up the event. Anytime you see something like that come up from the church, you can help us to be able to spread the word about Easter by sharing that uh, with your family and your friends and invite them to come with us. Second thing you can do this Saturday at 10 o'clock, we're going to take got some right here, uh, these invite cards and we are going to uh, share them um, in communities. We're going to go kind of door to door and just kind of put the canvas, the area with these invites and the really sharp looking little cards that'll invite people to Good Friday and Easter Sunday. So that's this Saturday at 10 o'clock. We'll have some donuts, some refreshments. And we'd love for you and your family to come out and uh, and hand those out with us. Um, if you can't make it Saturday, Pastor Justin will have a few maps printed out of different areas that you can take the these uh, to, or just hit your neighborhood and uh, and pass them out there. I do apologize. I just took a ball cap off and I uh, have some big hair, so we'll deal with that tonight. But I apologize. This is I got a receding hairline too, so y'all pray for my my hairline to stay strong. It's discouraging, but. First Samuel 25. Okay, first Samuel 25. What are we going to do? Okay, we got, I distracted myself. We've got um, share the stuff on social media, Instagram, Facebook, all those kinds of things. Share them as much as you can. This Saturday at 10 o'clock for the um, the handouts of the uh, of the flyers and canvas. Also on Saturday at 10 o'clock, Pastor Justin could use some help uh, stuffing Easter eggs. So if you want to come out Saturday morning, he'll be doing that around the same time, uh, late morning Saturday. And uh, if you have any questions about that, Pastor Justin, maybe throw in a comment of when you want them there for that. But um, stuff Easter eggs, get, get ready for the kids on that day. I think we've got somewhere over a thousand Easter eggs to stuff full of, of good candy. I told Pastor Justin, I said, I don't have very high expectations for the candy quality, but no Tootsie Rolls. Okay, no Tootsie Rolls. Maybe you can throw a comment in here. Does anyone actually enjoy a Tootsie Roll? It's the cheapest candy quality. I'm always disappointed. Okay. So especially don't, don't come at me with those different flavor Tootsie Rolls either. Like the yellow ones, the blue ones, no Tootsie Rolls. All right. So the kids will have some better candy than that. I don't know if you love Tootsie Rolls. I apologize, but um, you can get them somewhere else. But on that Sunday, Easter, that'll take place at 1030, the egg hunt. I apologize for the randomness of my thoughts tonight. I don't know where my, <laughs> where my head is. Um, other announcements, 10 days of Easter starts on Friday. You guys should have gotten that handout with the uh, the PDF there of all of the different um, uh, ways that we can share the message of Easter this year. And uh, we'll continue to maybe update you the, on those. If you missed Sunday, you can pick up one of those cards at church on this Sunday. And we'll be able to get those to you. We can remember how to, to share Christ with your neighbors. I know many of you took a stack of five of these and uh, have committed to handing those out this week. I would encourage you to continue to do that. And uh, we've got more of them. Okay, so we'd love to be able to get those out in our community as well. Okay. Um, announcements, others, I think that's it. Uh, good Friday service a week from Friday, we will uh, celebrate and remember the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. We will not have Wednesday evening Bible study next week. It will replace that with Friday night's, uh, good Friday service, but I really want to encourage you to come out and you can, um, just count on a really, uh, I think impactful time reflecting on the greatest sacrifice of all as well as uh, we'll take communion together that night. So just a special time. We do need to register. Okay, newhopect.com slash Easter has the button there to register for the Easter service you prefer, as well as the Good Friday service, just to let us know uh, that you will be there. Okay, 1 Samuel 25. 1 Samuel 25, now that I've adequately rambled and uh, talked about candy and my receding hairline for the last few minutes, let's let's actually get into uh, a study of scripture. Okay, 1 Samuel 25. 1 Samuel 25. Every day brings with it some new opportunities and more choices. 
I feel like at times the more choices I have, the more exhausted I get. Like too many choices sometimes. But each day gives this new opportunity for us to make decisions, for us to make choices. Each day brings it brings with it like a certain level of excitement, at least for me. Like I get to I don't know what today's gonna hold. I don't know what I'm gonna do today. I don't know the the what what's gonna go well, what challenges are gonna arise. Every day kind of has those those possibilities of success and failure. Um, as both the, the excitement and also the fear, right, of what could go wrong. God's mercies are new every morning, but so are the schemes of the evil one. I uh, love this poem. It says, yesterday's victories may become today's temptations. The sin we shamed yesterday, we may embrace today. Sunday's unconditional love can turn to Monday's selfishness. A tender, forgiving heart can become punitive and tough. And a refusal to retaliate can turn to cold-blooded revenge. Like the rest of us, David learned the hard way that you can't live on yesterday's obedience. You can't find victory for today and how you succeeded yesterday in following the, the commands of, of God. In the last chapter, he chose to leave revenge. You guys remember that from last week? Chose to leave revenge in the hands of God. And in today's scene, he's overcome by his desires. He's overcome by his flesh, by his his anger, and nearly commits murder. And this story doesn't end in the shedding of blood, but it ends in grace being shown. So I think we're going to look at David tonight in one of his more human moments, maybe one of his more relatable moments, and of the woman who God used to turn his hostile heart towards grace. If you remember last week, we've got Saul's manhunt that has been momentarily called off from David's uh, compassion from David's willingness not to take vengeance on Saul. He's he's backed off, and David and his his band of brothers have retreated back to their strongholds in Engedi. And uh, there's peace that was in place, but it was really kind of fragile. You know what I mean? Like there was there wasn't fighting right now, but you could tell that it could break off at any moment. And uh, we're gonna see that relief was very short lived, and it's not because of any moves from Saul, but. Um, we're going to see it in chapter 25, first Samuel, let's start, uh, verse number one. Okay. First Samuel 25, verse one says, then Samuel died and all the Israelites were gathered together and lamented him and buried him in his home in Ramah. So what is the next big hurdle that David's going to have to overcome? It has nothing to do with Saul. Now the, the, the big preeminent, important prophet and the last judge of Israel has died. Samuel was kind of the... He was the spiritual conscience for the nation. He was he was the spokesman for God. He was the anointer of kings. He anointed Saul and watched the man turn away from God and fail. He anointed David and watched him succeed initially and then have to run for his life. He never would see the young man that God said would ascend to the throne. This chapter in David's life opens with a lot of loss. It also concludes with mention of another loss. In verse number 44, Saul has given David's wife, his Saul's daughter, Michael, to another man. So it starts with loss and it ends with loss. David is kind of surrounded by pain. David must have wondered if God would ever avenge Saul's evil, if he'd ever would, would get his back, if he'd ever take care of this king who was coming after him and, and uphold his, his righteous cause as David David is tired, David is sad, and David left the cool of Engedi to scratch out some sort of living in a wilderness called Moan. And there he and his men employed themselves in protecting the local ranchers, in protecting their herds from invading tribes and wild animals. Um, it wasn't a volunteer force. No, they were signed contracts, and uh, they were given... It's usually customary for them to give like part of their uh, their crops or their or their their animals, their the flock to those who would protect um, their property from those who are after them. So David's now a contracted security guard. Okay, he's kind of a uh, a bouncer, a night watchman over this this farmland. And David's rancher that he's going to guard and take care of his property is a guy named Nabal. Nabal is a very wealthy man. He has three thousand sheep and a thousand goats, as verse two says. And there was a man in Maon whose possessions were in Carmel, and the man was very great or wealthy, and he had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. Okay? 
And now in verse number two, it says that it was time for him to shear his sheep in Carmel. It's time for Nabal to collect the wool and the profits from his vast enterprise. But we're going to see the sheep aren't the only ones to get uh, get clipped by Nabal. Okay, what I want to do is kind of look through the story almost like a play. Okay, we're going to start first with the cast of characters. Um, it kind of the story kind of reveals itself kind of like in a in a in a one act play. And uh, let's start with Nabal. Okay, so let's talk about him first. Nabal is from a distinguished lineage. He's a Calebite. Uh, which means he came directly from uh, Caleb, who's with Joshua, was that old man of, of courageous faith and of, and of tenacious faith. But Nabal shows none of that. Scripture says he is harsh. He is evil in his business. His name, Nabal, even means fool. And he recognizes, basically, he recognizes no authority in his life above his own. Not God's, not the king's. No one is in charge of Nabal. Somehow, however... He is blessed with a wife who is everything he was not. This wife's name is Abigail. Abigail was intelligent. She was clear thinking. She was wise. Her name means whose father is joy. No doubt giving a, a picture into her personality as a joyous person, as a sunny person, as kind of a positive, gracious, life-giving personality. Just the opposite of her husband. He was greedy. She was generous. He was angry. She was kind. He was hostile. She was, she was lovely. More than likely, they would have been joined together at this time period through an arranged marriage. And Abigail somehow managed to retain her dignity in spite of this, uh, this surly husband. So we have Nabal, we have Abigail, we have David. David's uh, company now of fugitives has been a shield around Nabal's shepherds and flocks without taking as much as one lamb. For their trouble. They haven't taken anything for themselves, no crops, no sheep. They've risked their lives for Nabal, and uh, now it's payday, I guess, is the, the easiest way to say it. And what we're going to see is that a whole lot of conflict comes on this day. There's a stubborn husband, a wise wife, a frustrated hero, and these players in this story and this play are kind of poised for, for conflict. The first conflict we're going to see is between husband and wife. Between husband and wife, Nabal and Abigail differ, like we said, vastly in temperament, in attitude, in even just in philosophy of life. They're so very different from each other. Um, maybe you're watching this and uh, you you kind of can 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 identify with that. Maybe you're a, a a woman who has a demanding, brutish husband that maybe you can empathize with. Some of what Abigail would have been going through, trying to keep a sweet spirit, trying to stay positive, trying to stay joyful. As the story progresses, we're going to see how she manages to stay true to her husband, to her Lord, and to herself. We're going to see conflict between husband and wife. We're going to see conflict between employer and employee. Maybe this is for you. The main conflict we're going to see occurs between Nabal and David, who has sent some of his men to request their share of the profit. Hey, it's, it's payday, man. He isn't pushy. He isn't grasping in his message. In fact, he's really gracious. Look at verse number five. Okay, verse number five. It says, David said to the young men, get you up to Carmel and go to Nabal and greet him in my name. And thus shall we say to him that liveth in, in prosperity, peace be to you and peace be to your house and peace be upon all you have. And now I have heard that thou hast shears. Now thy shepherds, which were with us, we didn't hurt them. Neither was there anything missing unto them all the while that they were in Carmel. Ask thy young men and they will show you. Wherefore, let the young men find favor in thine eyes, for we come in a good day. Give, I pray thee, whatsoever cometh to thine hand unto thy servants and to thy son David. Basically say, hey, we've, we've treated you with, with dignity. We've treated you honestly. We've upheld our side of the bargain. You can go ask the shepherds that we worked with. We were honest. So I think it's time for uh, for you to give us a, a, a piece of the pie, right? For you to, to return this favor to, to come up on your end of the bargain. But David replies, or Nabal replies in verse number 10, Who is David? And who is this son of Jesse? There be many servants nowadays that break away every man from his master. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my flesh that I have killed for my shears and give it unto men whom I know not whence they be? Basically, shall I just give my stuff away to these people that I don't know? Nabal isn't going to share a single crumb from his table. He snubs David, calling him a rebellious runaway. 
and sends the men home empty-handed. So conflict between husband and wife, conflict between employer and employee. Then we see conflict between David's conscience and his anger. When David hears Nabal's response, David, the picture of patience, right? The same guy that went and touched the king's anointed tells his men in verse number 13. Look at this. David said to his men, gird ye on every man his sword, right? It's fighting time. It's fighting time. Let's go take what's ours. Let's go take what belongs to us. Is this the same guy that last chapter refused to retaliate against Saul? Could it be that you can transfer this much? You can change this much from day to day. It, it sure, it sure is possible and because we know we've experienced it. We can raise our hands and worship on Sunday and rejoice in the Lord. And then Monday, the boss comes in with this request or my husband says this and we get right back in our flesh, right? Just shows us that our past victories don't guarantee today's victories. Each opportunity for anger produces with it the same destructive potential. Even though I didn't get angry yesterday, that doesn't mean I avoid the destruction that is waiting for me when I get angry today. Okay, we have to continue to fight, continue to war. In David's case, it was like a match that had been thrown onto a big pile of hay. I mean, it was, I mean, it was engulfed. In a moment, he was he was fired up with a desire for revenge. David's got his men on their horses. They're on their way. And as they're approaching, an unnamed servant, we don't get his name, warns Abigail of this approaching conflict. They're in verse number 14. One of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to salute our master, and he was ra- and he railed on them. But the men were very good unto us, and we were not hurt, neither missed we anything as long as we were conversant with them when they were in our fields. They were a wall unto us both by night and by day, all while the while we were with them keeping the sheep. Now, therefore, know and consider what thou wilt do. For evil is determined against our master and against all his household, for he is such a son of Belial that a man cannot speak to him. In other words, he's such a worthless dude that no one can talk sense into this guy, right? Help us, Abigail. We're all going to get slaughtered because of Nabal's foolishness. Abigail doesn't try to defend Nabal because she knows he's a fool. But she also doesn't give up, give him up to whatever he deserves, right? Give him up to his fate. Instead, she responds with wisdom. She responds with wisdom. She wisely considers the consequences of David's act, not only for her and her household and her worthless husband, but also for David, whose reputation as the soon-to-be king needed to be thought of, needed to be protected. So without her husband even knowing it, Abigail puts into action a, a plan. Quickly, she gathers together a generous amount of food, probably already prepared for uh, for Nabal's uh, sheep shearing banquet, this party where they get to harvest all this stuff and the money is here. So she gathers all this stuff up and she rides off herself to intercept David in the hills. Verse number 18, Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves and two bottles of wine and five sheep ready dressed, five measures of parched corn, 100 clusters of raisins, 200 cakes of figs. And laid them on asses, and she said unto her servants, Go on before me, behold, I come after you. But she told not her husband Nabal. And it was so, as she rode on the ass, that she came down by the covert of the hill, and behold, David and his men came down against her, and she met them there. So she meets him, she 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 goes and finds David on his way to to whoop up on her husband. She displays incredible faith. Look at verse one twenty six. It says, now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, seeing the Lord hath withholden thee from coming to shed blood and from avenging thyself with thine own hand, now let thine enemies and they that seek evil to my Lord be as Nabal. Okay, she's she's talking here about, um, you know, basically acknowledging verses 23 to 25. She acknowledges this is all Nabal's fault. And she addresses David very respectfully here as, as my Lord, referring, referring to his, his future position as the king. She displays her faith. Crediting the Lord, saying that it's the it's gonna be the Lord that restrains you from murder, and he's gonna start a new kingdom with you. That's what she says in verse number 27, verse 28. Right? That that he's gonna be the, the new ruler. In fact, this new enduring house she's gonna talk about, David's destiny, is something that she feels as an Israelite protective of. Look at verse number 30. She says, and it shall come, come to pass when the Lord shall have done to my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you. And shall have appointed thee ruler over Israel. 
though there shall be no grief unto you, nor offense of heart unto my Lord, either that thou hast shed blood causeless, or that my Lord hath avenged himself. But when the Lord shall have dealt with my Lord, then remember thine handmaid. She's saying, um, now I feel a responsibility to take care of your future reputation. We we need you, David. We need you to be a pure man. We need you to have not have not have innocent blood on your hands. Let's just go around killing everybody. We we need you. In all of this, she somehow remains loyal to to her husband, who has really good for nothing character. She doesn't join David's band or set her husband up for a for a fall of his own. She has three things, and these three things are necessary qualities of a peacemaker. She is tact. She has faith and she has loyalty. You want to be a peacemaker, you need to have tact, you need to have faith, and you have loyalty. She's had her say. She's as kindly and as appropriately and as carefully with her words as she could has displayed to David um, you know, why she thinks that he should you know, choose not to avenge through Nabal. And now she waits for David's response. As the events kind of play out, I only have time to get into all of it. All three conflicts are untangled between husband and wife, employer and employee, David and his anger. David quiets his anger. Hostility between David and Nabal is put to rest. And finally, in a really surprising ending, the conflict between Abigail and Nabal is restored, is resolved. There's two conflicts that are resolved through, through wisdom. David immediately embraces Abigail's wisdom, her true words, her wise words, dismissing his hot-headed decision. He too recognizes God's graciousness. David said to Abigail, verse 32, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which sent you this day to meet me. And blessed be your advice. And blessed be thou which thou hast kept me this day from coming to shed blood and from avenging myself with my own hand. For in very deed is the Lord God of Israel liveth, which hath kept me back from hurting you, except that thou hast come not to meet me, surely there not been left in Nabal by the morning light. Any that pissed against the wall. So David received of her hand that she had brought unto him and said unto her, Go up and peace to thine house. See, I have hearkened thy voice and have accepted thy request. Basically, David responds, I'm at, I'm at peace with myself. I'm at peace with your husband. And David now bestows peace on her. And she says, basically, go home. He says, go home and return to Nabal. Abigail walks in the door and just imagine kind of putting yourself in her shoes. She's tired. She's probably emotionally spent. Abigail walks in the door and she finds Nabal drunk as a skunk. Verse 36. Abigail came to Nabal and behold, he had a feast in his house at the feast of a king. And Nabal's heart was merry within him for he was very drunken. Wherefore, she told him nothing less or more until the morning light. Wisely, she kind of let him sleep it off before telling him what happened with David. Verse 36. And Abigail came to, or sorry, verse 37. But it came to pass in the morning when the wine was gone out of Nabal and his wife had told him these things that his heart died within him and he became as a stone. And it came to pass about 10 days later that the Lord smote Nabal and he died. Suddenly and, and ironically, the one who had a heart of stone, the Bible says became as a stone. But there's more. Look at verse number 39. When David heard that Nabal had died, he said, Blessed be the Lord that hath pleaded the case of my reproach from the hand of Nabal, and hath kept his servant from evil, for the Lord hath returned the wickedness of Nabal upon his own head. Two conflicts resolved through wisdom. The last conflict resolved through waiting. What does David do? David sent a commune with Abigail to take her to him to wife. And when the servants of David were come to Abigail to Carmel, they spake in her, saying, David sent us unto you to take thee to him to be his wife. She arose, bowed herself to the earth, and said, Behold, let thy handmaid be a servant to watch the feet of the servants of my Lord. Abigail humbly accepts David's marriage proposal, and we see a, a very happy ending for all those who put their trace, trust in God. What can we learn from this? Okay, interesting story. What can we learn from it? I think it's reassuring to know that yesterday's victories, they don't guarantee today's successes, but they also aren't guaranteed to become today's defeats. By listening to those who can show us all sides of the picture and by being humble enough to admit when we're wrong, we can rein in bad decisions like David did. This is one of the blessings of having 
close relationships. One of the blessings of having a, a godly spouse, of godly friends, is that they can give you the truth. They can show you another perspective. They can speak true words into your life, and it can rein us back from bad decisions. When conflicts arise, be wise. Be wise. Take time to think. Take a breath. Take time to step back from the situation before firing that text message back, before sending that hasty email, before, before blowing up in someone's face. Take time. Take time to think and remember how God's cared for you. Take time and think and remember how God cares for this individual and be wise in how you handle this conflict. And I think Abigail teaches us another, another lesson. Whenever you realize there's nothing that you can do in a situation, wait for God's help. Wait for God's help. At, at, Abigail's in a, in a lose-lose situation. I mean, she just, there's nothing to look forward to really in her life. Your story may be similar, but your story may be, won't end as suddenly or as dramatically as Abigail's. But what does remain consistent is God's help. God's help. When circumstances appear impossible, don't give up on hope. Don't give up on God. Don't keep going in your own strength. Instead, do what Abigail did. Rest. Be wise and wait on him. Psalm 40, David says, I waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He brought me up out of the miry pit. He set my feet upon a rock. It's a weird chapter of David's life, a weird chapter of his story. We see his, his rejection of revenge from last week doesn't guarantee that this week he won't try to exact revenge. His rejection of anger last week doesn't mean that he's not going to this week be angry. We see the benefit of opening ourselves up to outside words and outside counsel and outside advice and being humble and wise enough to hear it. And we see through the story of Abigail, how when you're in a, a losing situation, do what's right, be faithful, be loyal, trust in God, and I know that he'll come to your assistance. Would you bow with me for your prayer? Lord, we love you. We thank the opportunity you've given us to study your word tonight. And Lord, the story of David and Abigail here has so many applications for us. I pray you'd help us not to trust the victories of yesterday to guarantee today's successes, but you'd allow us to, in faith, continue to move forward and battle our flesh today. I pray you'd help us to open ourselves up to outside input and counselors and advice and, and loved ones and friends that can speak truth into our life when we're reacting in a way that is that is wrong or sinful, that we'd be humble enough to receive it. And I pray for those who may be listening to this tonight and they're in a hopeless situation, maybe like Abigail. I pray you'd encourage their hearts tonight with your provision for them, your care for them, your concern for them, and they would continue to be faithful and waiting for your deliverance. We love you. We thank you for the good things you've taught us in your word tonight. I pray we'd live them out for the rest of this week. Bring us back safely uh, Saturday for our prep for Easter Sunday in worship. And I pray you'd be honored and glorified through our church family this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so don't forget, Saturday morning, 10 o'clock, we'll have... Uh, Blitz Day, go out and canvas these around the community, as well as stuff the eggs and stuff like that on Saturday as well. And um, don't forget Friday, this week starts our 10 days of Easter and everything you see popping up on social media right now, make sure we're sharing that with our friends and our family uh, so they may be able to join us for Easter. And it's been exciting to see and hear already how God's using that. And we look forward to hearing about it in the future. I think that's all my announcements. We do have a, a church membership meeting the week after Easter, okay, so April 11th, at, in between the 10th, uh, the 9, 9.30 and 11 o'clock service, somewhere around 10.30, 10.35, we'll have our, our membership meeting and the, the annual finance report will be handed out at that time. Um, so make sure you're there if you're a member of our church. And I think that's it. So hope you guys have a great rest of your night and a great week. If I can help you, shoot us a message, but we look forward to seeing you back soon. God bless, guys. You're dismissed.